Hi, this is Manos Berlakis from the Minneapolis Heart Institute, presenting case 3 for the second edition of the Manual of CTO Interventions. This is a case of large vessel perforation that was successfully treated with a covered stand. This patient presented with recurrent angina after multiple stenting attempts of a saphenous vein graft to the left anterior descending artery. Diagnostic angiography shows patent left main with osteal occlusions of the LAD as well as the circumflex. A CTO of the distal right coronary artery with ipsilateral collaterals filling the PDA and the PRV. A saphenous vein graft to the obtuse marginal was patent with good flow. This is the vein graft to the LAD that had undergone multiple standing procedures and had currently restenosed in its osteal portion. And the patient also had a patent lima to diagonal that appeared to be normal. Therefore, given the multiple restenosis of the saphenous vein graft, consideration was given to recanalizing the native LAD and in that way avoid problems with the restenosis of the vein graft. To do this, uh, we perform a dual injection, injecting from the left main as well as the vein graft to the LAD. And what we saw is an LAD CTO with an ambiguous proximal cap and a small septal coming at the proximal cap. It's a long occlusion, probably 60 or 70 millimeters. The distal vessel is filmed well from that vein graft. And then, of course, we have an excellent retrograde option here, given that uh, the vein graft to the LAD was patent. So clear proximal cap, the length was long, distal vessel was of good quality, and had an excellent collateral, namely the vein graft. So given that, the initial plan was to perform the retrograde crossing via the saphenous vein graft. If it didn't work, go with undergrade wire escalation or undergrade dissection and re-entry. And this is the patient's baseline hemodynamics with systolic up to 120 millimeters mercury and um, some QRS prolongation of the electrocardiogram. We had difficulty advancing wires proximal to the saphenous vein graft that's down given the very acute bend. This is a 180 degree bend. And we were finally able to do that by using a filter FC and a CN guide wire. And then we were able to advance a fine cross catheter. And for those very acute bends, what we find quite often is that the softer microcatheters, like the fine cross or the caravel, may be advantageous. They may be more likely to take the bend than the stiffer microcatheters, like the Corsair or the Turnpike. So we advanced the fine cross to the distal cap, then perform, performed the retrograde injection. However, that doesn't look very crisp and we had a lot of difficulty advancing retrograde wires. However, we then thought maybe we should try just advancing undergrade wire quickly, and to our surprise, a Pilot 200 essentially crossed the entire occlusion, retrograde into the vein graft within minutes. And this is what some people refer to, that you should not try retrograde without first at least giving a brief attempt to undergrade, because occasionally, like in this case, you do get surprised and you have easing crossing through the undergrade direction. In this particular case, we then used a twin pass microcatheter to advance a guide wire into the distal LAD. And then undergrade injection after predilatation showed that we have some nice undergrade flow. We perform predilatation with a 2.0 by 20 millimeter balloon. However, the balloon ruptured more proximally. And after the balloon was removed, then we saw this large perforation of the medial AD with massive bleeding into the pericardium. The balloon was inflated proximally, but we forgot that the patient actually had excellent flow through the vein graft, so he was still bleeding retrograde to the vein graft. So we had to get a bigger balloon and place it immediately on top of the perforation. And now we had sealing of the perforation without um, continued bleeding into the pericardial space. After several minutes, we transiently deflated the balloon, but the perforation was still there, fairly large perforation with a lot of bleeding into the pericardium. The balloon was reinflated, thrustoracic echo demonstrated the beginning of a development of an effusion. We do get particularly concerned with perforation in patients with previous coronary bypass grafting. Because due to pericardial adhesions, the blood can form pockets of, uh, that can compress 
various structures on the left atrium, left ventricle, and cause shock that requires surgical drainage or CT guided drainage, given that it's not accessible through standard pericardiocentesis. And actually, this was one of the cases where we tried to perform pericardiocentesis, but we were unable to get in the pericardial effusion, probably because it was to some extent loculated. The balloon was reinflated, sealing the perforation transiently, and after prolonged balloon inflation, there was some improvement. However, there is clearly much more effusion on the transthoracic echocardiogram, and now we do have pulsus paradoxus with significant decrease in systolic pressure with inspiration that goes down to almost by almost 40 millimeters of mercury. We did uh, deliver a stent into the um, mid to distal LAD proximal perforation, and then just to be 100% sure, we did deploy a cover stent that was a 2.8 by 19 millimeters jaw stent graft master right on top of the perforation site. The cover stand was successfully deployed, and that gives us peace of mind that we're unlikely to get recurrent pericardial effusions, which can occasionally happen a few hours after the procedure. To be 100% sure, we performed transthoracic echo and we gave echo contrast definitive, trying to see if any of the echogenicity of the bubbles leaked into the pericardial space, however, there was no leak into the pericardial space, suggesting that the cover stand had successfully closed the perforation site. And the same was seen in various views. There was a pericardial effusion, however, it appeared stable, and the patient remained hemodynamically stable, although he continued to have some pulsus paradoxes. The remainder of the LAD was successfully stented, with long drug eluting stents, and a nice final result was achieved. We now have recanalization of the left main all the way into the LAD with an excellent result. There is still flow through the vein graft, which we didn't coil. Some interventionalists do suggest in cases like this to coil the vein graft so that there is no competitive flow which can cause the stenosis in the native vessel. But in this case, we considered it best to just leave it as it is. And this at the end of the procedure, can the patient does have a significant pulsus paradoxus, however, he is hemodynamically stable without any chest discomfort, and by using the echo contrast agent, we have definitely shown that there is no ongoing bleeding into the pericardium. We did perform, however, a CT to check about the bleeding, and there was the pericardial effusion. It was loculated on the inferior part of the pericardium. And that may be partially the reason why we could not get it in the subcostal space, because it was more inferior and posterior. The patient, however, did well and was dismissed without any complications. So, in summary, our case has several interesting messages. The first is that wiring through tortuosity can be challenging. We had to take a 180 degree bend in this case. And using a Pilot 200 or a filter FC wire can help get through that band and advance microcatheter through. The other lesson here is that sometimes undergrade attempt in cases that seem to be retrograde might lead to early success and obviate the need for doing retrograde crossing. The second important message here is that if a balloon ruptures, that can cause vessel perforation. So the first step in a balloon rupture is get the balloon out and then immediately get a picture to confirm that there is no perforation, because if there is a perforation, it is very, very important to advance a balloon immediately to the site of perforation and stop the pericardial bleeding to minimize the risk of tamponade. And this is of particular importance in previous bypass patients because they can develop loculated effusions that can cause tamponade that cannot be treated with pericardiocentesis and may require emergent surgery or computed tomography guided drainage. And uh, lastly is when a perforation like this happens, using cover stents can be life-saving, literally. In this case, all that we did seem to have hemostasis just using a prolonged balloon inflation. I think everyone felt much better and greater peace of mind by delivering a cover stand at the site of perforation just to ensure that there wouldn't be any reopening of the perforation site. 
Thank you very much.